All right, so here we are from Pharmacodynamics, continuing on with my legume-based humor. To, so you guys just ate anyway, so some food-based humor. Did you hear about the two peanuts that walked into a bar? One was assaulted. <laughs> All right, um, so we're going to continue. Uh, we're going to finish up section four and then move on into section five. We were talking neonatal and geriatric pharmacology. But uh, any questions from any previous material you've covered? All right, so anyway, we're covering acid-base status. Remember how that can have a pretty dramatic effect on how well things can be absorbed. Remember if you had something like a weak acid, how would that, what, what sort of solution uh, as far as pH goes, would it be better absorbed through say biologic membranes? Yeah, more acidic solutions, right? Remember, light dissolves like. So if we can put something like a weak acid into, uh, like aspirin, into the stomach, where it's more acidic, it's going to have an easier time being absorbed there. So we remember the, the base. Um, and again, every drug is going to have its own pKa. In case of a weak base, you find a pKa uh, B in, in those cases, but we can kind of, uh, everything will have its own pKa, essentially. So you can see even weak bases will have one. So things like, you know, cocaine, uh, we talked about being a base, uh, albuterol, et cetera. So again, you never will need to know these specific values, but just know that this is an inherent characteristic to all of these drugs here. And, and so it will affect how well it's absorbed and where it actually gets absorbed at. In fact, there's some cases where certain drugs um, can actually be degraded by the stomach and in, cor in, in order for it to be absorbed orally, you have to actually protect it as it goes to the stomach. And then once it gets into the small intestine, what happens to the pH? It goes up pretty dramatically, you know, because again, you're releasing bicarb and things like that to, to neutralize all of that. The pH goes up to pretty close to neutral, a little more uh, alkalotic. And so because of that, I can actually, um, sometimes you'll see uh, capsules. Uh, if you were to open up the capsule, you see these little tiny beads in it. So if, if anyone's ever taken like a Prilosec or uh, an Omeprazole or something like that, it's an over-the-counter uh, proton pump inhibitor. We'll sometimes use it for uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. But that is a capsule. If you were to open it up, there's just tiny little pellets in it. And those tiny pellets are actually protected from acid. They actually, um, that, that coating does not wear off until it gets into a more basic sort of medium. So I take that, opens up, all the pellets come out. They are protected from the acid because the drug itself will be destroyed by the, that uh, more acidic in environment. And then once it gets into the small intestine, that coating will wear away based on the change in pH, and then the drug can be absorbed. Which is why if you ever see a pill that says, I like, do not crush, do not chew, that is one of the reasons why you might see that, okay? Uh, because you, get, you need to protect it from the stomach acid, essentially, which can affect how well it gets absorbed or whether it gets destroyed potentially in that pH. But um, anyway, again, uh, just remember that uh, lipid solubility is going to be uh, inversely proportional to the water solubility for these molecules here. So something that's very lipophilic tends to be hydro obate, right, and vice versa, right? So again, and typically, in order for things to be absorbed, you want it to be more lipid or water soluble to be absorbed across the membrane. It needs to be more lipid soluble for that to occur. Now, however, you need these things to go into solution. So if you had something that was completely immiscible with water, chances are it's going to have a hard time getting absorbed anyway. So um, and this is all going to, on sort of a, a scale here where you can have things that can still be dissolved in water, but they may be just more lipophilic. So it's all kind of on a scale. Again, just looking at the polar nature here, again, how salt uh, or sodium tends to be very, uh, very polar because when it breaks off in those ionic bonds, uh, when it breaks up with, with chloride, you know, it's going to be having an electron taken away from it. It's very easily soluble in water, right? Versus, uh, would this have an easy time crossing uh, phospholipid bilayer? They have a pretty hard time, right? Because it's got that charge on it. In fact, there's some drugs, when we put a positive charge on it, a permanent positive charge, it actually prevents it from crossing some membranes. So for instance, um, we have some drugs, you mentioned, we talked about opioids before, how those work, you know, in the CNS to help with um, you know, pain relief and, and things like that. Um, and things like morphine, think heroin, things like that. Well, um, one of the things we can actually do is, is to, uh, I said a big, uh, big side effect of those opioids was constipation. Remember we talked about that being a big side effect. Um, and so in some cases, we may have patients who need to be on opioids. They need that brain effect, but they don't like the GI effects. They don't like to be constipated all the time. Um, and so what we'll actually do is we'll give them a drug that will block the effects in the GI tract. It can be absorbed there and block the effects in the GI tract. However, it has a positive permanent charge on it that it prevents it from crossing the CNS and prevents it from going across the blood brain barriers. So by pause, putting that charge on it, it doesn't get up into the CNS where it blocks the effects of the opioids. So they still get pain relief, but now they can go to the bathroom. And one thing I will tell you guys probably uh, ad nauseum uh, is gonna be never underestimate the value of a good poo, okay? Patients can come in, they'll have a worse abdominal pain in their life. 
Um, they will have all kinds of uh, vital sign abnormalities. As soon as you give them one good defecation, they're going to feel a million times better. Vital signs will correct. Um, we do this with a lot, of, like especially hospice patients who are on a lot of pain meds. Um, we do this a lot with especially pediatrics. Um, you know, one time my cousin called me up and he says, "Oh my gosh, I'm bringing my little girl. She's she's like four or five at this time. I'm bringing her to the ER. She's got the worst abdominal pain in her life. I think she's going to die. I got she's constipated." Ah, this can't be constipation. This hurts too bad. It's, it's, he's, she's going to die. And I was like, no, no, she's fine. She's constipated. Sure enough, he calls me like two hours later, like, yeah, I gave her an enema. She pooped, and all of a sudden, she was great. She, we went right home. So, again, we see this stuff all the time. So, never underestimate that. Anyway, this slide. Um, here's also what happens if you had a uh, particularly hydrophilic bear. It's very polar, right? <laughs> Anywho. So remember, um, as we've kind of gone over this uh, example before, but again, weak acids tend to be more soluble in a more acidic medium because, again, we're putting it into the uncharged sort of state here, right? So again, with weak acids, there's a higher number of hydrogen ions floating around. You're going to be forcing this equation over onto the neutral aspirin, the uncharged sort of variety of it in the, in the acidic environment of the stomach that absorbs it much easier. It's going to be much more lipid soluble versus if I were to, say, put it into a more basic environment, it's going to force the equation over onto this side because I'm losing the protons, essentially, and this is going to have a harder time being absorbed. So again, we've kind of covered this already, so you guys are pretty familiar with that, that idea. Similarly with a weak base, they're going to have an easier time being absorbed in a more basic medium because as you put it into a more acidic environment, you're going to see it's actually going to pick up a hydrogen and it's going to be in the, in the charged state at that point, right? So again, these are just inversely related to one another. All right. Again, protonation just means when it's combining with the protons, that's basically picking up a hydrogen ion. Um, in weak acids, the protonated form is going to be the neutral one. So when it picks up a hydrogen ion, it's going to be in the neutral form. With weak bases, the unprotonated form, the one that has not picked up a hydrogen ion, tends to be neutral. Okay? Again, uncharged or neutral, more lipid soluble, easier to cross those membranes. And again, remember when we were at the pH, when, uh, when the drug, say, with a pKa of, say, 3.5, is that a pH solution of 3.5? What does that mean? It's going to, well, basically it means that when, a, when the pH of the solution matches the pK of the drug, it means it's going to be 50-50 split between the protonated and unprotonated state. And so again, by modifying the pH of that solution, by changing it, um, I can modify how much of it's going to be in the protonated state versus the unprotonated state. And I can modify just how well uh, absorbed the drug is going to be in those cases there. Um, so I mentioned that, that uh, case with aspirin, where I actually talking about the uh, elimination of aspirin within the urine. Right, so if someone who overdoses on aspirin, they have a whole lot of, uh, of it in their system, I need them to pee it out as quickly as possible, right? And so one of the things you'll find is if I have more acidic urine, so say the pH of the urine is say around five or so, I'm gonna have a higher proportion of that aspirin in the state that's gonna be protonated, right? And it's gonna be much more easily absorbed through the renal tubules. That's not what I want, I wanna get rid of it. So what I can do is I can alkalinize the urine, I can increase the urine pH up to say like eight, and by doing that, a much higher proportion of it's going to be in the charged, unprotonated form, because it's a weak acid, and then it's much more water-soluble. It's much less lipid-soluble. It does not get reabsorbed, and then they just pee it right out. So I can see very easily by checking the levels of the drug over time that as I alkalinize the urine, they're going to be eliminating much, much more quickly, right? And that can help, ultimately help the patient uh, survive a you know, potential overdose, whether intentional or otherwise. And again, um, you don't have to do, I will not force you to do this math here, but just know that when the pH and the pK are the same, it's going to be a 50-50 split, essentially, right? <clears throat> Again, in the uncharged state, things tend to be more lipid-soluble. All right. So anyway, so how is this going to affect us with drug elimination? Let's get more into detail on that. Now, again, excretion, uh, is this... As I was kind of referring to this, you know, weak bases tend to be usually excreted faster in more of acidic urine. So in those cases, you may want to acidify the urine. Generally, what you'll find with, uh, within medicine is we don't intentionally acidify patients. We may alkalinize them because, again, most of the time when things are going wrong with a patient, they tend to become more acidotic. Uh, however, potentially you could uh, cause a weak base to be excreted faster, but that's usually not what we do. More frequently, we might do like a weak acid to make it more alkalotic to, again, prevent that reabsorption. So aspirin is kind of the prototypical example of that. Okay, usually, urine usually is a little bit more acidic, so again, usually between, you know, maybe between five and seven, depending on the situation, depending on what's going on. Um, we'll realize when we go into the renal section of physiology that um, how the kidneys are handling hydrogen ions, how they're handling bicarb is very, very important. You can modify that pretty dramatically to, to help make sure that the, um, that the pH of the system, the serum pH, is going to be relatively within normal ranges, right? Because the two places we maintain uh, that we can change our pH is mainly where? What two organs? 
kidneys and the lungs, right? So the lungs can be pretty fast. Kidneys take a little bit more time, but um, kidneys can be very important for that, which is why the the, uh, the pH of the urine changes pretty dramatically depending on what's going on in the patient. But as we mentioned, uh, another good example uh, would be a phenobarbital. Have you ever heard of this drug before? If a patient's ever asking for peanut butter balls, that's probably what they're referring to. But again, you never know what they're asking you in some cases. Um, if you ever have like a dog that has like seizures, like they oftentimes will put dogs on phenobarbital. So it's a very common uh, anti-seizure drug, anti-epileptic drug. Um, this is a similar uh, scenario with aspirin. It's a weak acid. If I put it into more alkaline urine, it's gonna prevent reabsorption. It gets eliminated more quickly, okay? Okay, so looking at bioavailability, remember what is bioavailability? Yeah, basically the amount of drug that the body's going to be absorbing, that percentage of drug that makes it through, right? So we mentioned with like IV, it's 100%, right? Versus oral, it's going to be what? Could be anything. Could be zero, could be 100, just all depends on the drug. So let's say, for instance, we're dealing with an example, uh, this drug called propanolol, right? I mentioned that's a beta blocking drug. It would be used for, uh, say, someone's tachycardic. It could bring down the heart rate, it could bring down blood pressure, several uses for it. But let's say, for instance, we're dealing with 160 milligrams. We're taking one tab, PO, PO means? by mouth, and then we're taking that daily, right? Anyone know another way to abbreviate daily? QD. Never ever use QD. QD can be misread. Uh, and in fact, I'll, uh, if you look at your prescription assignment, you'll realize that there is a list of do not use abbreviations. Things are easily mixed up. It's put out by the Joint Commission who handles accreditation of hospitals. Um, we do not use QD. Always write daily, once daily, anything like that is totally fine. But if I see QD, We'll not mark you off for that, okay? Um, because you get in trouble in the, in the clinical world if you're writing that, people are reviewing your charts, they'd be like, that's, that's not appropriate, right? Because it can be misread as something else. Um, anyway, so let's say we have propranolol. It's a weak base. It's highly lipophilic. It has a PKA roughly of 9.4. So again, um, it's highly lipophilic at that PKA. Do you think it would lead to a very good or very bad absorption? Just knowing it's lipophilic. It's pretty well absorbed, right? Because it's lipophilic and crosses membranes pretty well. And in fact, propranolol is kind of interesting because if you give it to older people, because it is so lipophilic, it actually crosses up into the blood-brain barrier very uh, easily. And in fact, uh, these patients can actually uh, report nightmares and, and uh, worsen dementia and things like that. It's actually a drug we don't like to give to old people. But um, the other thing you have to consider is not only how well it gets absorbed across those membranes, but additionally, um, how much of it is going to be hit by the liver, right? What do you call that effect? First pass, right? So again, what percentage of it's going to be uh, eaten up by the liver before it gets into the systemic circulation? So in this case, let's say approximately 25% uh, reaches the systemic circulation. So of that original dose of 160 milligrams, how much of that actually made it to the system? So approximately 25% reached the systemic circulation. So 25% of 160? 40 milligrams, right? So again, so the bioavailability at that point is only 25%, even though it did get absorbed very easily, right? So again, this is going to be different for every drug, but in this case, there's a very high first pass sort of effect. Now, it's important because, for instance, I have uh, I have IV forms of propranolol, I have PO forms as well. So that's where you have to take into account, because if I give 160 milligrams of uh, propranolol IV, how much of it is going to be bioavailable? 160 milligrams, right? So if I were to give someone 160 milligrams IV and 160 milligrams PO, that's not an equivalent dose. You have to take that into account. And so when you're looking at, say, for instance, your, your dosing regimens, if you were to look at like Lexicomp or Micromatics, wherever you're looking at it, you realize there's IV dosing, and there'll be PO dosing in a lot of cases. And they can be quite drastically different. In this case, maybe 40 milligrams of IV per parental would be equal to 160 milligrams PO. Make sense? Okay, all of it goes back to that bioavailability and how it can be very different depending on the route that you're actually going to be uh, administering. So in this case, 160 milligrams PO, only 40 milligrams actually made to the systemic circulation. So um, now let's say, for instance, we have a half-life of approximately six hours. What's the half-life? How long it takes for 50% to be metabolized in this case. So let's say, for instance, um, we're going to have a six-hour half-life. So that means that, you know, z hour zero, after it gets absorbed, uh, we have roughly 40 milligrams in the central circulation, right, flowing around the bloodstream. At six hours, how much should we have left? 20 milligrams. Uh, say at 12 hours, 10. What do you notice about this elimination? Remember what type it is? Or is it doing the same percentage of drug every period of time? Mm, close. First order kinetics. Yeah, it's actually first order kinetic. Remember, first order means if I put more drug into the system, more gets metabolized, right? It's always the same percentage, but all is mm -hmm. going to be to a point where uh, as I increase that level, more of it gets metabolized. As I get to lower and lower levels, less of it gets metabolized. It's always going to be 50% every six hours, right? Now, however, if I said it's only, say, 10 milligrams every six hours, what would you call that sort of kinetics? 
that's zero order. It's only going to be a certain amount of drug per unit of time. It's important. And, and again, you can switch. You can go from first to zero whenever like, you saturate the enzymes. And for some drugs, that is clinically uh, important. For a lot of them, though, it isn't. Most drugs follow which kinetics? First order. So again, under, you go under the assumption that most drugs are going to follow first order. And we'll just, uh, take it at that, right? There's some specific examples. Alcohol is a good one, um, but some uh, seizure drugs and things like that may be zero order. But first order is going to be the majority for, uh, for these. Okay, so let's say distribution-wise, we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, how the, the propranolol actually gets distributed to the system, right? So let's say 90% of the circulating propranolol is bound to plasma proteins. So let's say alpha-1 acid like a protein is one of our serum proteins. 90% of that propranolol is being bound to it. So at this point, how much of it's actually going to be physiologically active? That's another question we have to ask ourselves. And at this point, if it's bound to the serum proteins, do you think it's uh, available to interact with, say, the beta receptors in the heart? It actually won't be, right? So again, you need a free drug. Drug has to be unbound for it to be physiologically active, right? And again, which beta receptors in the heart are going to be interacting with primarily? Beta 1. Remember, beta 1 is a big thing that's going to be driving the heart rate there. Um, so if I block that, that should cause what? Bradycardia, right? It should cause the, uh, the the effect of epinephrine to be limited. It's going to cause bradycardia, right? So again, it's one of those things you're going to we'll, we'll become very familiar with as we get into specific drugs in farm. But basically, in this case, 90% of it's protein bound. So we know, we know we have 40 milligrams at time zero because that's how much got absorbed because we only had 25% bioavailability. Now the question is, well, how much is, it, is it actually physiologically active? And we say, well, 10% roughly, which means we only have four milligrams. So again, I gave 160 milligrams initially, but only four milligrams is actually active at any given point. Okay, to actually interact with the receptors. And so that's why we asked, what is this fraction? Now, could you, how could you change this fraction potentially? What if I had less protein, right? What if I had less protein actually there to bind the drug? Now, all of a sudden, what would that do to the free fraction? That would actually go up pretty dramatically. And this is actually clinically important in some cases where you could, um, for, for some drugs, you'd actually, uh, you can test both free levels and total levels. Total will basically tell me both of these together, whereas a free level can tell me just what's actually physiologically active. It can be important. So for instance, if I have someone who has, uh, say for instance, a seizure disorder, and on this medication, and it's a narrow therapeutic index drug, remember what that means? Yeah, a toxic dose and an effective dose are very close together, essentially. Um, and so basically, you can have a person who has, a, say, a normal level, say between 10 and 20 is a normal level, and this guy's level is 15, but he's still stumbling around, he's got a nice stagmus, ataxia, you're like, what the heck is going on with this patient? He's, he has a therapeutic level, but he's obviously toxic. What could be going on? In these cases, it could be due to the serum proteins being uh, out of whack. So for instance, if albumin is too low for some drugs, you're going to see that the free fraction would go up in those cases. And so instead of having maybe 10% free, maybe now it's 20% free. So now he has twice as much drug available at the receptors and that's what's causing the toxicity. Okay. So always be careful when you're interpreting these levels. We'll have a whole section on that later on, but just kind of keep that in the back of your mind there. Right. Okay. So let's go and do, do a little bit of basic math together. Again, these are, uh, if I was going to have you calculate anything on the test, it would be basically using this kind of very simple calculation here. Right. Again, where our C0, which C0 uh, is, oh, yes, ma'am. Free. If it's bound to proteins, it's not going to be physiologically active, right? Because it's bound to the protein, can't interact with the beta receptors. There. Um, so again, if you were to know an equation, this would be the only one I'd actually have, have you do anything with. And again, you don't need calculators on the test. It's going to be very basic math for the most part, right? It's figuring out half lives. It's figuring out you know those, those sorts of easy things that you can do. Um, you know, if you can divide by two, divide by ten, chances are you're probably going to do okay on this test, right? Everyone can do that. Maybe not like test time. Maybe like, oh, I have any idea how to add two plus two, much less divide anything by two. But no, you guys will do fine. Um, so let's say, for instance, remember C zero, which is what does C zero? Um, what does that represent? It's our initial concentration, right? So it's going to be the initial concentration. Is it going to be equal to the dose that we administer, right? So in this case, let's say 160 milligrams we're going to be administering divided by the volume of distribution. What does volume of distribution tell me? How far out the drug is expanding into the tissue, essentially, right? So again, something with a very low volume of distribution tends to stay much more centrally in the bloodstream. Something with a very large distribution goes out into the tissue, right? And we said that what does lipophilicity mean for volume distribution typically? Yeah, usually things that are more lipophilic like to go into the fat tissue. Remember we talked about THC, right? Remember how we talked about how that can stay in the system for a long time because it's a very large volume of distribution, likes to partition in, into the adipose tissue, right? Um, so typically that's going to be the general rule of thumb for, for most drugs. Anyway, so let's say, for instance, we wanted to, to figure out some of the stuff. So let's say we have a 70 kilogram typical. Oh, yes, sir. You're saying about how THC spreads in your tissue. Why don't you feel the effects of it for the entire time? 
because the when you end up having the THC out into the tissues like that, you're going to find that there's an equilibrium that will um, go between the tissues to the bloodstream, right? And so because it is so lipophilic, it will have a higher proportion there, um, and you have a little bit of it leaching out into the into the bloodstream. Um, usually not high enough concentrations to actually cause the the kind of psychedelic effects you would be expecting from the drug. Versus if you were to like say um, ingest some THC or if you were to smoke it or something like that, you'd be getting a big rush of high concentrations. This is a relatively low amount in, the, in that regards. Does it have to do with like some drugs that will last in the system? The effects will. Stay for a while. It, it just depends on what the steady state level is within the bloodstream, right? So again, as long as you're keeping steady levels within the blood, um, that should equate to some sort of surrogate uh, amount that's in the tissue. As long as it's high enough to get the effect you're looking for, then yeah, the drug can last for that long, essentially, right? It all goes back to how long natural drugs are, are, are that effective, you know, for the most part. Because with some drugs, you'll find that, like, especially like a urine drug screen, like with cocaine, you're actually metabol uh, you're actually detecting a metabolite that sticks around for a few days. You're not actually detecting actual cocaine because uh, the patient might still be under the effects of it at that point. But THC, that's actually specifically what we're measuring, and, and just people don't have a high enough level to actually get the the, uh, the effects from it. Or maybe they become tolerant to that very low level sort of effect potentially. It could be kind of multifactorial. I'm just not wondering for personal reasons. I'm, I'm sure so. I'm just <laughs> just kidding. Um, and I don't want to know if anyone is, just so, just so you know. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so, so let's say, for instance, we had a 70 kilogram, uh, pretty prototypical sort of male patient. Uh, he's administered a 160 milligram dose, right? So we already said the bioavailability of the oral dose of propranol is what? Yeah, so 25% is what we're working with. So we say, okay, well, the amount of circulation is going to be 40 milligrams, essentially. So let's say we do a plasma level. We go ahead and draw a level off of that patient in their blood, right? And we're going to, we actually get a concentration of 0.14 milligrams per liter, okay? This is another thing I'll note uh, when you're doing a prescription assignment. And anytime you have a decimal point here without a, like a one, you always want to put a leading zero. What do you think that is? If it's missed or if someone misreads it or if it's very faint or anything like that, uh, it can be misread as what? 14, right? So 14 is a lot different than 0.14, right? So always have a leading zero whenever doing something like that. Now, if it was the flip side, if it was 14, would I want to put a trailing zero there? No, why is that? It can be misread as 140, right? So be very careful with that. You always want a leading zero. You never want a trailing zero. General rule of thumb when you're writing prescription or whenever you're doing anything with these uh, sorts of values here. Anyway, so the question is, well, okay, well, now we have, I know the dose we administered, and I know what the what the concentration is. Well, I can use that. I can figure out actually what the volume distribution is. Because we mentioned the volume distribution can change depending on the patient's disease states, can depend on their the body habitus, can depend on lots of different things. So again, using this initial equation, C0 equals dose over VD, I can rearrange that to now equal uh, the VD in liters is going to equal dose divided by C0. Okay. And so again, I can figure out these things. I can figure out, okay, well, why is this patient not getting the right level? Why are they experiencing... Uh, you know, none of the clinical effects I'm looking for, why are they really toxic? A lot of it can go back to figure out, okay, what are these levels? What's the volume distribution doing? Is this normal or abnormal based on what we're seeing with the patient there, right? So in case, this case, how would I figure that out? So my dose in this case, what would it be? I go ahead and use 40, right? Because that's only what actually got to the systemic circulation divided by 0.14, right? So let's do the math together. I don't remember if I have it on the next slide or not. So I'm going to go and do the math so I don't lose the numbers. But if I did 40 divided by 0.14, what do you get? You want to do the math? 286 liters. Okay. Does that sound like a big volume of distribution? Sounds like a little volume of distribution? Or it says pretty lipophilic drug. So you could probably safely say it's a big volume of distribution, right? So again, 285 liters is apparently is uh, is the volume. We'd have to give that same amount of drug, that same 40 milligrams in order to get that same concentration. So it seems like a pretty big volume of distribution. Makes sense because we said that it's actually going to be a, um, you know, a pretty lipophilic drug. And so actually what we can do is we can take that information, we can take that 285 essentially or 286 in this case uh, and divide it by the patient's weight and then get this value. There's going to be four liters per kilogram. By using that, now we can actually either apply that to another patient. So if I say, okay, well, this guy is pretty representative of the, you know, say another patient I'm going to treat, I can assume they had the same volume distribution. I would just take that four and multiply it by their weight, essentially, right? And so I get a new value of the volume distribution for someone who may be smaller or bigger, essentially. And remember, uh, remember the cut point I said between, say, like a low and a large volume distribution? If you're ever curious to know like a normal value or a normal dose or anything, just say one. One's usually uh, the case in most cases, in most instances. Anyway, anything less than one liter per kilogram is considered a low volume distribution. Means it does not like to distribute to the tissues. Anything with greater than one 
it's typically a large volume distribution, loves to go out to the tissues. In this case, this is four, it's a pretty large volume distribution in, in this case, right? And just by dividing by the 70, we take the patient's individual weight out of the equation essentially. Okay. You kind of get an idea of the concepts here? Bioavailability and distribution, how we're using all of this in order to be able to, to you know, look at blood levels and actually make some determinants on that. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and take that information and maybe apply it to a different patient. So let's say, for instance, we're dealing with a 50 kilogram female. Let's say we administer a dose of 120 milligrams and we know the volume distribution. Now we can actually predict what her level is going to be. So how would we do this? So assuming bioavailability is the same between the two, we give another oral dose of 120 milligrams. What should be the amount that makes it through? 30 milligrams. So this is only 25% of that original dose, right? 25% makes it through because I had a pretty high first pass effect there. So what I can use is that 30 milligrams divided by the volume of distribution, which I'm going to take 4 liters per kilogram and multiply it by that 50. So 4 times 50 is 200, right? So I can take 30 divided by 200, and then what do I get? Do 30 divided by 200, and it should get a level of 0.15. So, okay, so 0.15, because again, you know, we have a smaller patient, we're giving a smaller dose. It's pretty similar to what we saw with the last patient, right? There, I think they're like 0.14 or so. So you can see how by modifying the dose and by looking at the volume distribution, how we know it's going to change for that patient, you can get a similar serum concentration. Maybe that's the therapeutic concentration that we're looking for, right? And again, you'll find that, you know, for certain drugs, you're going to say, okay, well, this is the therapeutic range. You want to shoot between this level and this level, right? And so when we get to the therapeutic drug monitoring section later on, we'll show you what that looks like and kind of what, how we would do that for, for an individual patient, okay? Again, you see here, 0.15 milligrams per liter would be the patient's estimated concentration. I could then draw a blood sample off of her and see if that was actually true or not. Um, if not, then something else was going on. Maybe she had an altered volume distribution. Maybe her first pass effect is different, um, you know, depending on liver enzymes and things like that. So, But this should be a good estimation. And typically, when you're doing drug calculations like this, you're kind of taking population estimates that they've done in studies and applying that to an individual patient. So is that always going to be a one-to-one -one sort of extrapolation? No, because your patients may be a little bit different, right? Everyone likes to think they're a snowflake and they're a little bit different, right? In some cases, they kind of are. In a lot of cases, they may not be, right? So I, I say snowflake not in the derogatory term, but just in the case that everyone has a little bit of different uh, idiosyncrasies to them. Um, you know, uh, everyone's going to be a little different. So again, always, always, always remember to treat the patient, not the number, okay? Cannot uh, stress that enough because, again, just because you get a level that comes back and looks weird or something seems a little bit unexpected, go back to the patient and actually see what is going on with them specifically that is influencing this. And you're going to be able to find – you're going to make better decisions on their behalf um, when you're looking at them and not just looking at a number and kind of going with the gut reaction sort of uh, decision, okay? Okay, so let's say, for instance, um, we have a 100-kilogram male now. Anyone know the conversion between kilograms to pounds? 2.2, so 100 kilograms times 2.2, so this patient would weigh yeah, 220 pounds. I will tell you, for all drug dosing, stick to kilograms. And in fact, get used to working with kilograms now, because almost everything done in medicine is dealt doing in the, in the metric system here, okay? For whatever reason, us as Americans, we like to use the imperial system, or, yeah, it was, it was silly. Ounces and... and drams and all kinds of weird stuff we used to use. Not anymore. All metric, right? So again, we're dealing with liters, we're dealing with mLs, we're dealing with kilograms, grams. Uh, just stick with that. And again, and when I had, like grade notes for my students, I always say, well, get, just get into the habit of kilograms because the sooner you can start to look at a, a kilogram weight and sort of get an idea of like, how big the patient is, that's going to be able to help you a little bit uh, more quickly because again, most EMRs, EMR stands for electronic medical record is just going to put uh, kilograms on it, right? Because again, it's important to keep everyone consistent because one of the problems you can run into, especially dealing with pediatrics, right? So again, if I accidentally um, weigh a patient and the scale is set to pounds and I input that into the system, the system thinks it's receiving kilograms, now what's happened? It looks way too big, right? Because again, the patient has 2.2 times number of pounds as they do kilograms. So now the patient looks like a lot bigger. And if the doc is going through or the provider is going through and they're putting in a dose and so many milligrams per kilogram, now it's going to be way off, right? So for instance, one way we get around that is all the scales, like at our hospital, we automatically disable the pounds uh, feature and just make it so everything's kilograms. So again, work on getting that kind of consistency and get, kind of get comfortable with working on these metric units here. Okay. Anywho, so let's say we have a 100 kilogram male patient. Um, he has a concentration in the plasma of 0 0.05 milligrams per liter. And again, we're going off of the, the volume distribution. We're assuming that this is not different for this patient. It's going to be four liters per kilogram. Okay, so it's the same as we saw in the other ones. Now we can actually estimate what dose did this patient actually receive. So how would we figure this out? Because we know the C0. 
We know the volume distribution, and so now we can figure out what the dose is going to be, right? We just rearrange the same equation and kind of tell us the same thing, or tell us you know, a, a different variable here. We're just answering uh, very simple you know, kind of algebra sort of, sort of problems here. So how do I how do I go about this? So the first off, the volume distribution would be what? So four times. 100, so 400 liters for this particular patient, right? Because you multiply by their individual weight. And that's going to be multiplied by their concentration. So 0 0.05 times 400. And I get what? 20. So I get 20 milligrams. Now remember, what was the bioavailability of that dose? It's only 25%. So I can take that uh, 20 and do what with it? Yeah, I can multiply by 4, or I can maybe divide it by uh, 0.2. That would give me basically the same thing, um, or I'm sorry, 0.25, uh, and that would give me the same answer. So basically, the dose that we could estimate he received was 80 milligrams, right? So you can make an estimation, okay, well, do you get too much, too little? And that is how it can kind of help us to do, do this uh, sort of uh, work clinically, essentially, right? Kind of make sense? So again, just by figuring out two of the variables, you can always answer the third. All right. So putting it all together, let's say we have a new drug. Say it's called sarcastinol. It's going to help us with people who might be overly sarcastic. Not that I would ever know anyone like that, but um, let's say it has a weak, it's a weak acid, it has a pKa uh, of roughly 5.4. Uh, I'm sorry. I also have listexia, uh, if you were wondering. Uh, let's say it has a bioavailability roughly 90%, right? So 90% of that drug is going to get through stem, uh, into the systemic circulation after an oral dose. And let's say it's going to be a VD of 0.2 liters per kilogram. Okay. And then let's say we normally dose, let's say 500 milligrams every six hours. Okay. So can I keep these variables in mind? as we go forward and start to work on some of these problems here, okay? All right, let's say after a 500 milligram dose, how much of it actually gets absorbed into the systemic circulation? So we said 90% uh, bioavailable, so how much of it would get through? 450 milligrams, right? So 500 milligram dose, already losing 50 milligrams of that to the liver tax, should be getting 450 uh, into the systemic circulation. Now, for instance, let's say, for instance, we were to add, uh, let's say, a base uh, into uh, the the, uh, the GI tract. Let's say we gave them some Tums, some calcium carbonates, an antacid. Um, what do you think it would do to the pH of the GI tract? It's an antacid, so it should be should be higher. Right? It should be more alkalotic. You should expect to increase the pH there. And then we mentioned that the drug is a weak acid, has a pKa of 5.4. What do you think it would do to absorption of that drug? It should decrease it, right? Because it's going to be more in the uh, unprotonated state. It's going to be more in a charged state at that point. It's going to have a harder time. It's going to be more hydrophilic but less lipophilic in that instance, right? So you could actually decrease the absorption. And this is an important drug uh, interaction we run into uh, quite frequently, because again, we have older patients, you tell them to take a lot of calcium, right? Because you're worried about their bones. And so this could be something uh, where they, they take it with their tongues, right? So that could uh, directly affect how well they absorb their drugs, essentially. So that's one thing to consider, right? Let's say it was a weak base or weak acid in the last one. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, saying the Tums is a, is a base, right? So again, we see decreased absorption in that case, right? All right, so let's, uh, what would be expected uh, serum concentration after a 500 milligram dose? Let's say if we have a 70 kilogram male, okay? So again, we're going to be solving for the C0 because we want to know what the serum concentration is going to be. And our dose, we know is going to be what? We're going to go ahead and put a 450 in there because we're going to assume it's a 90% bioavailability. That's not a change at all. And then what do we say the volume distribution was? I don't remember what was on the slide, if anyone could tell me. <laughs> hmm? 0 0.2 liters per kilogram, right? So I can do 0 0.2 multiplied by 70, good. And remember, it was 0 0.2 liters per kilogram. Is that low or high volume distribution? So it's a pretty low volume distribution, which means the drug is where, mainly? In the bloodstream, which means my serum concentration should be higher or lower than something that would say more uh, distributed further out. Should be a little higher because again, it's also uh, you know kind of being sequestered within the blood. I should expect these concentrations to be a little higher. So okay, so our volume distribution for this patient is what? 14. Yeah, 14 liters, right? So again, 14. You always want to keep your units straight. It's going to be 14 liters. So we can say, okay, we're going to take 450 divided by 14, which is we get roughly a concentration of. 32 milligrams per liter. And of course, you always want to keep your, your unit straight there. So again, 32 milligrams per liter, okay? And again, so you notice that concentration is a lot higher than something we saw with like propranolol, which had a very high volume distribution of four liters per kilogram. Those concentrations were coming back at like 0 0.14, 0 0.15, whereas this one has a concentration in the blood of 32, right? So again, a lot of that drug is still being sequestered in the bloodstream, 
and preventing it from going out to the tissue there. So that's why this concentration seems so much higher, right? But again, every drug is going to have its own therapeutic range, essentially, to some degree, and you're going to find that, okay, maybe 32 is perfect for this sort of drug, whereas for propranolol, 0.15 is perfect for that drug. So again, just because the number is bigger does not mean anything. It just means that it's going to be more sequestered there in the bloodstream, okay? Okay. Uh, let's say we have a 45 kilogram woman who's taking sarcastinol. Now she's experiencing excessive amounts of sarcasm. And now her serum level is 75 milligrams per liter. So what dose do we think she took? All right. So anyway, so let's figure out our volume distribution. What is that going to be? 0.2 times 45. times 45, because she's 45 kilograms. So she'd have a volume distribution of? Nine liters, perfect. So she has nine liters of uh, volume distribution, and we know that her concentration is 75 milligrams per liter, right? So again, going back to the equation here, remember it's C0. Again, I am left-handed, so this is looking to look really bad. Equals dose over VD. I'm like Zorro if he's having a seizure. Um, but so again, we can we can uh, figure this out. We know volume distribution. We know that uh, the concentration is 75 milligrams per liter. So how would I figure out the dose? Rearrange it so that dose equals C0 times VD, right? Again, it's very simple algebra what we're, we're doing here, right? So again, if I took that 75, multiplied it by 9 liters, what should I get? 675. And remember, though, that it's only 90% bioavailable. So how do I get back to the dose that she probably actually took? Oh, yeah, I can divide that by 0.9. So 675 divided by 0.9 equals 750 milligrams. So we know the dose should have been 500 milligrams every six hours. Maybe she's taking 750 every six hours. Maybe she said, oh, I'm not sarcastic enough. I really need to take some more of this stuff. And she took too much. And now she's got all this excess of sarcasm, right? Again, very poor example, but it still illustrates the, the, the pharmacokinetic points here, right? Yes, sir. Oh, my microphone cut out? <clears throat> hello, hello? No? Oh, no. Okay, so uh, does that make sense uh, based on what we've covered so far? Okay, so again, the basic principles here. And again, a lot of this work has already been done for you when you're looking at these drug references, but this is what goes into making these sort of decisions here. Okay, um, let's say we have a 45-year-old male. He's taking 500 milligrams, uh, but he has a plasma level of 20 milligrams per liter. How much does he weigh? He could actually potentially figure out how much he actually weighs based off of this. So how, do that, how would that work? So we know it's a 90% bioavailable. So we know the dose making it to the circulation is 450 milligrams. Perfect. Okay, and we know that he has a level of 20 milligrams per liter. So what we can do... Let's take the volume of distribution equals dose divided by C0, right? So again, does that make sense how we got to that point? All right, so I'm going to take my dose, which is 450, divided by 20. I should get 22.5 liters, okay? And we said, what is the uh, volume of distribution uh, for this particular drug? It's 0.2 liters per kilogram, okay? So I can take that 22.5 and do what with it? So again, if I were to have, do more writing here. Say for instance, I know it's gonna be 0 0.2 times their weight. Again, this is really embarrassing, but <laughs> equals 22.5. You'll be like, I had to learn farm from an illiterate person, but. <laughs> so I can take 22.5 and do what? Divided by 0.2. And what do you get? 112.5. So we could assume that he is 112.5 kilograms. And again, there might be a little bit of wiggle room there. It's probably plus or minus, say, 5%. But that would be roughly what you'd be able to get. That makes sense? Again, that is not a calculation you would normally do in the clinical realm. I'm just trying to show you that you can go the extra steps and even uh, potentially uh, determine what that patient actually weighed. Okay? So again, um, but you know we do these calculations quite regularly for certain drugs, and we'll go over some examples of that in the therapeutic drug monitoring section later on. Okay, so um, bioequivalence. I mentioned what this term means. What would you think it means based on the name bioequivalence? It's biological equivalent between two, two different drugs, essentially. This is how we come up with uh, generic drugs, which what, what's the benefit of generic drugs? 
cheaper, right? So they come out, they have the brand name drugs, you know, drug companies, it costs a lot of money to put a drug out in the market. And so they need to try to recoup that cost uh, and, and, you know, answer the shareholders for that 20 year period, right? As soon as that 20 years is up, then the patent is lost and then they can now uh, have generic manufacturers come in. But, you know, you don't want to get like discount, like, you don't want like Torlinol, you want Tylenol, right? Like you want something that's going to work just as well. Like you don't want to get like discount Knock off drugs. It's not good. See, this is the problem with the microphone. Out of instinct. Anyway, um, <laughs> you want the real stuff, and so the generic manufacturers have to show the FDA. I remember the Food and Drug Administration. They're the one. They're the arbiters of all things drugs in the U.S. They have to show that they're going to get uh, equivalent effects, and that's a, kind of the problem. And and one of the issues we're running into is you know people are having a hard time affording medications. Where do they go to get them? Hopefully not. I hope not the streets. I don't know. Where <laughs> but uh, perhaps not the U.S. But maybe where else? Canada or, or yeah, it's either Mexico or they go to Canada or other places like that. But again, um, because the FDA is not necessarily sanctioning those drugs, it's hard to say. Well, are they actually going to be the the exact same? So that's why um, it is uh, you know frowned upon from a federal standpoint. Even though you know, a lot of people, that's the only way they're going to afford their meds, and they got to do what they got to do essentially, right? So it's one of the things we have to consider. Anywho, um, basically what we're going to be showing the bioequivalence that these drugs are going to have the same biologic effect, even though they're not the same, um, uh, you know, made by the same manufacturers essentially, right? Because again, when you get a generic drug, it's the same chemical, it's the same chemical property. However, some other things can change with that, right? So for instance, you can change the color of the tablet. You can change the shape of the tablet as long as it's the same amount of drug and it still has the same characteristics. And again, this is all going to be within a certain margin of error. You just like, you know, plus 15, minus 10% or so. So there's, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. Uh, but you can see, for instance, here's a drug called bupropion. Anyone know what you use that for? Depression, it's also used for smoking cessation. We heard drug called Zyban, um, but uh, depression is one of the more, more common things we'll see with that. Uh, and so basically with 150 milligrams of bupropion, say for instance, this is the extended release, this is the brain name. I'm sorry, this is like the generic they're coming with. This is in the green. In the brain name, the Wellbutrin XL in the red, they have to show that, that when you give a dose, and again, this would be measured by doing kind of serial concentrations within the patient's blood, they have to show they have to get within a certain normal range. And then by the time they go to the next dosing interval, they should be at approximately similar levels, okay? So when a patient comes up and they say, I only want the brain name because that one works better, chances are it's more psychosomatic than anything else because they've been shown uh, that if they're on the market, they have shown this bioequivalence essentially. They should work just as well as a brain name drug. <clears throat> So when we're talking about pharmaceutical equivalents, this is going to be basically referring to the same active ingredient, which is the actual the chemical actual agent we're talking about, to the same dosage form, same route. So if it's PO, it's PO. If it's IV, it's IV. Um, same strength and concentration, right? Um, they can differ in the shape. Uh, scoring, when I say scoring, what does that mean? It's not like 15 love, but... The actual, there's a, like a demarcation on the pill itself. We could actually split it in half or thirds or something like that. So it's called a scoring. Um, release mechanisms, the packaging... Excipients. Anyone know what excipients means? It's kind of all the inactive ingredients that go into the, the dosage form. So, for instance, you know, uh, when you think of like, you know, 325 milligrams of Tylenol, which is a pretty standard dose for Tylenol, uh, that whole tablet actually weighs a lot more than that because there's things like, you know, inactive ingredients like talc and there's other, you know, coloring things and, and other things like that, preservatives potentially, um, that uh, those are the inactive ingredients, those are excipients. Those companies have to show that that's not affecting the actual drug itself and not making it work any, any less well. Do you have a question? You're stretching. That was kind of my question. Oh, yeah. Because I was going to say, like, people would think that the generic isn't working as well because the inactive ingredients being causing the additional side effects. But... Yeah, so that's actually a good point, um, which I was going to make later, but thank you for bringing it up now. Um, Basically, you may find an issue to where maybe a patient has, like, say, a, a bad reaction to one of the components. So, for instance, if you have, like, a dye allergy. Uh, some people have, like, a red dye allergy, and so if you had a tablet that had, contained that red dye, it's probably not going to be too good for you, right? You're going to have a, an allergic reaction to that. And so that could be one reason why you say, okay, well, I only wanted to use the brand name uh, because uh, it lacks that dye, right? Uh, however... Most circumstances, though, the, these need to show this certain bioequivalence so you can be, at least as a practitioner, be really well uh, well assured that they should work very, very similar together, if not um, identically so, right? Because as a pharmacist, even if you write down Wellbutrin on your prescription, if there's a generic form that's available, by law, I can switch that out unless you write dispenses written. That's actually one of the things you have to write on a prescription to absolutely make sure you get the brand name. Uh, if you don't write that, then I can substitute it out because, you know, uh, it, it is our service to the 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 public that we, you know, give them something as cost effective as possible, right? Um, and so because they show bioequivalence, we can feel okay doing that essentially. Um, 
Now, you can't have things that are going to be pharmaceutical alternatives, and so these would not be bioequivalent in these cases. So, for instance, you could have different salt forms of the same drug. So, for instance, you have something like tetracycline. Anyone use tetracycline for? Some people use it uh, for, for acne. Um, it's also an antibiotic, uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that in, in, in Farm 1. But um, you could have something like tetracycline hydrochloride versus tetracycline phosphate complex, and these may have different release characteristics. There could be uh, different enough to where if you write for tetracycline hydrochloride, I would not want to substitute that out for a different salt form unless I you know, called you and got the okay to change that potentially, right? So, again, that would be a pharmaceutical alternative. They're not equivalent at that point. Okay, therapeutic equivalents um, are going to be pharmaceutical equivalents if they're expected to have the same clinical effect, though. So if I were to, say, switch out the drug for a different salt form but expect to get the same effect, then I can consider that a therapeutic equivalent because they get the same thing, uh, same job done, essentially. But in order to be a therapeutic equivalent, they need to meet the same, uh, these, these uh, criteria here. So they need to be safe and effective. Okay, there should be a uh, no-brainer there. They need to be pharmaceutical equivalents. And they need to contain the identical amounts of the drug, uh, ingredient, the same dosage form, same route of administration, and they have to be considered bioequivalent here, right? So again, these would be cases where if I was switching it out for that generic, I could say, hey, they're, they're therapeutic equivalents, essentially. So how do we know that? Um, well, basically, there used to be this big book called the Orange Book. Now it's all online, but the FDA uh, puts this out. And again, I'm not going to ask you uh, specifically, you know, are these two drugs bioequivalent? But I'm kind of showing you how what goes into that. Um, because for a while, there, and actually there still is, on the Florida uh, laws, there's what we call a negative formulary. And there are actually a list of drugs we cannot switch out for the generics because there's enough difference in their clinical uh, efficacy that if they come in and they're on, say, uh, Synthroid used to be the drug that was on there for a long time. Synthroid we use, uh, it's basically uh, synthetic T4 that we give for patients with hypothyroidism, that was on there for a long time. So if they said they're on Synthroid, I could not give them a generic because it was worried, uh, there was enough worry that there would be a difference in clinical activity essentially. But uh, Orange Book, and basically it's published by the FDA, and it'll give us kind of these equivalency codes. So basically anything with an A rating would be equivalent to one another, and we could say, okay, yes, these are therapeutic equivalents, we, they're bioequivalent, we can switch them out, no problem. If it has like a B rating, then we consider that not to be equivalent, and then we could not switch that out essentially. Just an example, say we're looking up uh, propranolol. Um, say, for instance, you're looking at these two drugs. These are BX formulations. These could not be considered therapeutically equivalent. However, with these AB ratings, I could switch those two out, and it would be no problem. The patient would not have, experience any difference in treatment based on me switching out those generics there. So anyway, just so you know kind of what goes into it. Um, and, and when you should feel rest, you know, rest assured that uh, when you take a generic, it should be working just as well as a brand name drug. Okay, so any questions on that? If not, let's do a 10-minute break. We'll come back and talk about Peds and Jerry.